Okay, we're going to talk about muscles of the neck and answer the what questions. What muscles are found in each plane of cervical fascia? What are their actions and innervation? And what's the deal with the different layers of muscles? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So my approach for this is going to be covering the muscles based upon their location in the cervical fascia. So we see this cross section through the uh, neck. And so I'll cover the muscles in the superficial and in the deep investing and in the prevertebral and in the pretracheal fascias. So let's start with the superficial fascia and the platysma muscles. So here's a cross section of the neck around the C6 vertebra and there in red is the platysma muscle which is in the superficial fascia or hypodermis. And so from this lateral view, there's our platysma muscle and it's going to come from the corner of the mouth and the angle of the mandible all the way down to the sternum and clavicle and that fascia over the pec major and deltoid. And so the platysma muscle wrinkles the skin of the neck. And what that means is we take a look at this picture and you see that action right there. Bam. And so you see those fibers in the arrows are showing the platysma muscle that tenses and wrinkles the skin of the neck um, shown in that red diagram where the platysma is. Um, and the innervation is via the facial nerve, cranial nerve number seven. And so there's cranial nerve seven right after it comes out the stylomastoid foramen and it comes down and the cervical branch innervates the platysma muscle. It's the only muscle I think really that the cervical branch of the facial nerve innervates. So we've covered the muscle in the superficial fascia, now the deep investing fascia, which includes our sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles sternocleidomastoid or SCM, and trapezius. Let's start with sternocleidomastoid, which is named according to its attachments. And so there we have the sternal attachment, clavicular attachment, and uh, clido means clavicle, and the mastoid process, hence sternocleidomastoid. And the sternocleidomastoid turns the head to the opposite side and it flexes the neck on the same side. So here we have the sternocleidomastoid on the left, and when it contracts, it turns the head to the right. And so the left sternocleidomastoid causes you to look over your right shoulder. That's one action. The also, it has you to, uh, the sternocleidomastoid flexes the neck on the same side. So the right sternocleidomastoid flexes or bends the neck on the right side like that. And the trapezius muscle, this elevates the scapula or shrugs the shoulders. And so there's the trapezius muscle from the side, and there it is from the front superimposed on uh, this model, and you see the traps elevates the scapula or shrugs the shoulder. It does other actions, but that's covered in greater detail in the back muscle. So the scapula uh, elevation of the shoulders and the other big one is the extension of the head and neck, things that you see the head. And there we have the head that's flexed and the trapezius muscle extends the head and neck from here to here. We're next going to talk about the innervation of this SCM in the traps, which is through cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve. In this lateral view, we see the spinal accessory nerve there within the posterior triangle of the neck. The uh, spinal accessory nerve exits through the jugular foramen and then gives a nerve innervation to the sternocleidomastoid, courses across the posterior triangle of the neck, and innervates the trapezius muscle. The deep investing fascia, now we're going to the prevertebral fascia muscles. And so those include the scalene muscles, the anterior, middle, and posterior scalene muscles. And in this cross section, there's anterior, middle, and posterior scalene muscles. And shing, cervical and brachial plexuses exit between these anterior and middle scalene muscles. Now let's look at an anterior view. There is our anterior scalene, our middle scalene, and our posterior scalene muscles. And up high, you can see the phrenic nerve, a branch from the cervical plexus exiting between anterior and middle. And then there's the brachial plexus exiting as well between the anterior and middle scalene. So this term scalene is Greek for uneven because the anterior, middle, and posterior scalenes are all different lengths. Now, let's do a small detour. The trunk consists of the neck, the thorax, the abdomen, and the pelvis. And then you have the head on top and the two limbs upper and lower limbs. But the trunk are these three things. So the abdomen in cross section, we notice the following. There is the external oblique, the internal oblique, the transverse abdominus muscles, and then the lumbar and intercostal nerves course between the internal oblique and transverse abdominus. Now let's take a look at a cross section through the thorax. There's the external intercostal, 
internal intercostal and innermost intercostal muscles. And look, the intercostal nerves course between the internal and innermost intercostals. Now let's look at a cross section through the neck. There's the posterior scalene, there's the middle scalene, and there's the anterior scalene muscle, and the cervical and brachial plexuses exit between the anterior and middle scalenes. So the take home point for this is the following. The anterior lateral trunk wall has three layers of muscles, and the nerves and vessels course between layers two and three. The neck, the thorax, the abdomen, and the pelvis all work in that way. So back to the scalene muscles. They elevate the first and the second ribs. And so here we have the scalene muscles, and you see when they contract, they elevate that first and second rib that helps to increase the diameter of the thoracic cavity, which increase the volume of the lungs that helps you inhale. Then you also have lateral flexion of the neck. So when you look at this view and you see there's the posterior triangle of the neck because it's between the traps and the sternocleidomastoid, and the muscles that form part of the floor are the scalene, tri uh, scalene muscles form part of the floor of the posterior triangle, and they bend the neck to the same side, lateral flexion of the neck. The scalene muscles are innervated by branches from the C4 to C8 ventral rami. So here's a picture of the brachial plexus and labeled C5 to T1. I don't have C4 on here, but branches coming off of the ventral rami from C4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are going to then go and innervate the scalene muscles. Levator scapulae elevates the scapula, shrugs the shoulders, and there's the levator scapulae in this cross section, and there it is here in this posterior view. Again, this muscle, even though we find it in the floor of the posterior triangle of the neck, and it's part of this in this prevertebral fascia, it covers in more detail in the upper limb scapular, link, scapular sling content. Now, the longest capitis and longest coli muscles, and here in this anterior view, there's our longest capitis. This word longest, as its name indicates, is a long muscle that attaches to the head capitis, like a baseball cap. And then there's the longus coli, long muscle in the coli, which is uh, abbreviation etymology is neck. Long muscle attaches to the head, long muscle is on the neck, and it's there in the cross section. These muscles are important for topo topographical, but functionally not as much. There's some little bit that can be done if during whiplash they can get injured, but for the most part clinically it's just nice to know, it's good to know where they're located. So, muscles in the prevertebral fascia, now muscles in the pretracheal fascia. This includes the infrahyoid muscles, the sternohyoid, thyroid, omohyoid, and thyrohyoid muscles. Woo! There is our sternohyoid, our sternothyroid, and our omohyoid muscles. Now let's take a look at them from an anterior perspective. And to do that, this is you're looking at someone in their chin, they're looking up at the ceiling. There's the hyoid bone, there's thyroid cartilage or your laryngeal prominence, and there is the sternum. And so when you look at the muscle at the arrow and you think, what's the name of that muscle? Anatomist said, well, it goes from the sternum to the hyoid. Let's call it the sternohyoid muscle. But wait, what about this muscle? Well, let's go in from the sternum to the thyroid cartilage. We'll call it the sternothyroid muscle. But what about this one? It's going from the scapula or shoulder, which is the abbreviation OMO, to the hyoid bone. We call it the omohyoid, shoulder to hyoid muscle. And what about this one that's going from thyroid cartilage to hyoid? thyrohyoid muscles. And so the actions of these muscles is simply, not simply, what they help depress and support the hyoid bone. So when you swallow and the hyoid bone goes up, it helps to bring it back down. These are uh, uh, postural muscles with the hyoid and to the extent the laryngeal prominence, the thyroid cartilage. Clinically, it's not like you're going to be testing these muscles. Um, they're innervated by the cervical plexus, specifically the ansa cervicalis. So here's the cervical plexus from C1 to C5, and in yellow is the ansa cervicalis. It has a superior limb that comes from C1 and an inferior limb that comes from C2 and C3 ventral rami. And so what happens is we see off the superior limb, there's a nerve to the thyrohyoid and the geniohyoid, it's above the hyoid bone, a nerve to the omohyoid, to the superior belly, a nerve to the sternothyroid, the nerve to the sternohyoid, and then a nerve to the omohyoid, the inferior belly. Basically, I show them all here, but really if you know that these infrahyoid muscles are innervated by the ansa cervicalis, clinically that's sufficient. Okay, um, there we have it.
So why are both somatic body wall muscles and branchial arch muscles found in the neck? So here in this cross section, take a look. There is our somatic body wall muscles. And what I mean by that, they're derived from the somites. So there's sternohyoid, sternothyroid, or normohyoid. And then there's our scalenes, levator scapulae, and also the abaxial muscles, the paraspinal muscles. And the branchial arch muscles, like the platysma from branchial arch uh, number two, and the sternocleidomastoid and traps from the hind arches. So what's the deal? Why do we have this? Well, to answer this question, we say the head and neck are like an orange on a toothpick. <laughs> funny movie. So there's an orange and there's a toothpick. So watch what happens. It doesn't look very stable and thump. That's what would happen. Okay. It would just drop. So even if we go, let's push this back up and you let go, it drops. So you push this back up and it drops. So what do you do to stabilize this orange? Well, let's put some, some maybe some bungee cords on the back like this and tighten them. Uh, see that? You tighten and it goes up. Well, the head and neck are like an orange on a toothpick. You have an orange and you have a toothpick. So then when it falls over, you put some bungee cords, we call them the sternocleidomastoid in the traps, and they do this. They bring the head up. Because the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius are both hind arches that are basically coming from the head and they migrate down. And so what happens is you've got these semitic muscles here, like those infrahyoids and the scalenes. Those muscles, for the most part, attached to and from within the neck. They don't go to the head. So the head would flop forward. So then we have these branchial arch muscles like sternocleidomastoid and traps that migrated down to the shoulder and to the back to help stabilize this orange, the head, on the toothpick, the neck. And that, my friends, are the muscles of the neck in a nutshell.